Welcome to MQC, the Massachusetts Cloudball Chat for off-pitch chats with Carson and Sierra. We're going to start off with a recap of last weekend's games. So the first round robin was with Harvard, Brandeis, and Brown. And we'll go through kind of game by game what we saw, what we think, you know, some improvements could be. Uh, starting with Harvard versus Brandeis. Um, I know it's only been a couple episodes, but my prediction came true. It was not a particularly close game. Um, the score, I think, ended up being Harvard 185, with Brandeis only being able to score 30. Brandeis actually started with like an early lead, I think two goals from Brady Gunther to start the game before Harvard even scored. Um, then they completely stalled out for the next like 18 minutes. I think they got one more goal going into SOP, but that was about all they were able to put on the board. Um, I think Eli Fighter got like two yellow cards in his first shift, which limited, which limited how much he could actually play. I think a lot of the beaters on Brandeis looked just like not ready for what the Harvard beaters threw at them. They were pressing really high. And even when like the Brandeis beaters would win trades, it looked a little lost of like what they should be doing after that. And then I think really once like Harvard beaters kind of found their groove, it was kind of just game over from there. Yeah, I think a big step for Brandeis going forward and going into Cup is having their beaters think about the decision after the decision and thinking about like, okay, I've made this choice. Now what is the choice that follows up to help my chasers succeed? Yeah, I think outside of that game, honestly, it, it was a bit of a, a blowout for Harvard. Um, they caught, which is also always going to be good. Um, not a lot to talk about, which could lead us to Harvard versus Brown. A very similar game, um, Harvard 185, Brown 20. Um, I think there's probably even less to talk about. Um, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on that one, but... Yeah, I think, I mean, I know Brown had a little bit of a shorter roster this weekend, which probably didn't necessarily help things on their end as far as keeping their legs under them for the whole time. Um, but they did manage to score 20. And I don't think that's something to like balk at. Harvard's a very good team and them being able to string those together, I think shows that they can do it. Yeah. Which brings us to the most interesting game of this round robin from last weekend, the Brown Brandeis game. Uh, overall, a pretty close game. I know as it was going on, I was watching the live stream. It was pretty neck and neck for most of the game. Brandeis did finally get the win, uh, final score of 130 to 100 for Brown. Um, overall, lots of foul trouble. I think there were 11 total cards, um, just yellow cards, I think, um, across the game for both teams. So pretty, pretty tough for actually getting to, you know, play with a, a full team there. I think probably the card trouble that the teams found themselves in probably limited any momentum that either team could gather with repeated stoppages throughout. Um, so we'll see maybe later on the season as they clean up their game, how they perform once they can get some momentum going without, you know, card stoppages. <laughs> yeah, I always feel like these games are like kind of the more interesting ones where it's actually like close and I don't know how Brandeis felt going in, you know, where they kind of thought Brown was. But I feel like when you're playing a, a team that maybe you think you should be, you know, at least have a, a steady like kind of goal I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, but a, like a goal or two, like... Yeah, a buffer. Mean? A buffer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, like, if you have a goal buffer, um, you know, I feel like when you don't necessarily have that, it's kind of a test of, like, where the mental strength on your team lies. Um, so I think Brandeis did a good job there. Um, I think a lot of their offense was just reliant on fast breaks and really getting to transition. Um, I know their beaters and even their chasers were playing pretty aggressively, um, and I don't think Brown was always ready for that. Um, I think sometimes they had like an errant pass that just got picked off um, and then they were able to run. Um, they being Brandeis. Yes. Able yes to they, run. Yeah. Brandeis <laughs> was able to run. Um, I'd say Brown looked a little bit better in like the half court, um, but I think it was reliant on like a couple key, key pieces there. Yeah. I know um, Muhim Ali wasn't playing this weekend and by the end of the game, I think Brown was playing down a player due to a couple of injuries. Um, so I'm impressed to see them hang on so close with those circumstances. Yeah, I think like Will Richardson, I know we've talked about him and Thomas Flathers, again, another person who's no stranger to the, the chat. Um, 
were kind of the duo that was working best for Brown. I know in watching them, a lot of it was like taking space and then just like finding each other. Mm -hmm. Um, They looked like they knew kind of what they wanted to do. It wasn't so stagnant in like the half court where one person's just passing back and forth with no off ball motion. It always kind of felt like one of them was moving in to get like a pass in a dangerous position, which is something that I would like to see Brandeis kind of add. I do think they kind of needed a lot of the fast breaks and obviously for SOP that opens up just a lot more. Um, so yeah, I'd really like to see them figure out kind of what a half court's going to look like for them. Um, I think most of the times when they were able to run a half court, it was an SOP where there's just no beaters and it gets a little bit easier if you have maybe like an athletic advantage on one player or a size advantage. So I am surprised that neither of these teams caught in their game. I see there's no five at the end of Brandeis final score or at the end of Browns, especially considering I think the seeking talent on both teams. I mean, I don't know if Will ever came out of the chaser game for Brown, um, but like Eli Fighter for Brandeis, Rowan Scossolati, those are good seekers (laughs) and they didn't catch this weekend. So I'm curious to see um, what that means for both of these teams moving forward if this is like if a catch is something that they can regularly rely upon yeah i think a good note on that one too um since you brought it up i think this was the actually the only game this past weekend in which the flag runner wasn't caught and so i think it actually be really interesting yeah like every other team i think managed to do it obviously like harvard in their two games i think caught um and we'll get to the the next series in a bit but yeah the only team that didn't and yeah i think to your point like how are they going to prioritize roster management when like 35 points is something that's super helpful, especially in like kind of a neck and neck game like this. Yeah, I mean, Brown catches and it's a tie game. Yeah, exactly. Which brings us to the second round robin of the weekend. So that was Emerson, UVM, and Tufts. I think it started with Tufts versus UVM. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think... Tufts just wasn't necessarily equipped to handle the physical presence that UVM brings. Um, This kind of just allowed UVM to convert on offense, especially in like fast break scenarios where a player could get ahead of steam and just start moving. Um, Tufts doesn't really have like a large physical presence on the field right now. Um, So that's really hard to stop for anybody once they start moving. Yeah, I know from like the games I've watched of UVM, I didn't catch this full game. I think a lot of kind of the like energy that they bring is a lot of people are just willing to kind of drive in Um, not always looking for like a dish or anything or like any potential cutters there but I think a lot of them have that confidence to like take the space and so if you're a team that maybe isn't ready for the physicality or kind of that contact I think it could catch you off guard and catch you a little flat-footed. Yeah I think something that Tufts can definitely look to to improve their game going forward is um, making sure that chasers and beaters are kind of on the same page. They looked pretty disjointed um, in their play not really one not really knowing what the other wants to do on both offense and defense. Um, So I'd like to see them develop like playing the same game together. Yeah uh, a constant struggle in the sport um, which brings us to the next game. So UVM versus Emerson. Uh, I think the final score for that one was 75 for UVM and Emerson with 110 taking the win there. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this I one mean, too. This game, I think, even though it happened, I think before the final Emerson Tufts game, um, both teams, I think, had to set up more half court offenses. Um, which really slowed down play, I think. Um, and then more decision-making had to be made. Um, and I think that messy passing was a big part of this game for both teams. Um, when mistakes were made, they led to turnovers, and they were most frequently because of, oh, a bad skip pass. Oh, a pass into pressure. Oh, that beater has a range right there. Why did I throw the ball? That sort of thing. So I think seeing both of those teams improve in making smart passes, easy passes, avoiding the kind of long lobs, especially because I think it was raining this weekend. So like, it's wet, like, work smarter, not harder here. Yeah, I think a big thing for a lot of college teams is really just focusing on those fundamentals. I think like even at like club, like MLQ level, like a team with good fundamentals, you can tell. Um, And so yeah, I'd really like to see a lot of these college teams, I think just like nail down the passing because like once you have the passing down the cutting driving everything else becomes so much easier because you can do like the basics that you need to do 
Um, yeah, I'd say there's not a whole lot more to, to talk about with that game. I think there were some good performances on both sides, uh, which takes us to Emerson Tufts. I think that one was Emerson 175 to 20 points from Tufts in that game. Um, I think Tufts just kind of got tired out. I know they've been working with a bit of a shorter roster in a lot of their series. Uh, and so I think kind of scoring about half as many goals as they did against UVM on Emerson, who Emerson beat UVM. So like hypothetically the better team, um, I think it's something still to like be happy with. I feel like for Tufts, a lot of it is like taking those small wins and just trying to build on that and really like have a lot more growth come like later in the year. Yeah. Um, Emerson took both of these wins off of game winning goals from their superstar, <laughs> Aiden Hickey. Um, who has showed once again that he is lethal when he's just allowed to shoot um, and also just has great field vision to distribute to his teammates that I don't think that Emerson has without him on the field. And that's a grow. And he's, you know, in his third year playing, he's got the experience to support it. I played with him when I was in college He's been around. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And I think it shows when he's on the field, there's more of a sense of calm and confidence. Um, so, yeah. I think even on that point, I know like at national qualifier, and I don't know how the, the bowls are going to shake out for like the D2 champion and D1, um, but Middlebury and Emerson, I think are looking pretty likely to maybe, you know, have a, a final meet for the D2 champion. Um at qualifier, they both played, and it was really just a back and forth kind of of Hayden Lassiter, who isn't going to be there for Middlebury this semester, and Aiden Hickey, just going back and forth taking shots. And so kind of interested to see how that will turn out come the spring semester. You know, uh, I don't know if both of them will be there or not, um, but to your point, I think Aiden Hickey, you know, a phenomenal shooter and really adds a lot to the, the Emerson team. Which brings us to the next event for MQC. So it's not going to be a round robin this coming week. It's just going to be a series of two games with Tufts and Middlebury. Uh, it's going to be starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday, March 9th at Fletcher Field, which is at the Tufts campus. Um, I feel like we've been talking about Middlebury pretty much every week. Um, you know, they have stars in Jason Wu, Kate Petty. I feel like we kind of talk about them all the time. Um, really would like to see a lot of kind of just like getting everybody integrated into the offense. Um, they have players like Sadie and August who I think are always in the right spot. It's just about figuring out like what to do next. And I think really how to get them the ball in more dangerous positions. Um, they've looked like they've been improving kind of like every week. And so I think it's really just like how, and maybe a series like this where it's maybe not going to be as competitive can they kind of get them just like more involved in the offense not so much just like a catch and finish type of thing but like actually have you know taking space or like looking for shots or anything kind of like that yeah I think um you know Jason and Kate can definitely set their teammates up for that by kind of taking more time to distribute I know in the moment you want to take your first scoring opportunity but maybe it's not always your best so maybe looking for the second or third and if your teammates are in those good positions, like you said, then you'll be able to find them. Cool. Which brings us to Tufts. Um, not sure what kind of roster they'll be working with. I think this is a great opportunity for Tufts, though, to, you know, kind of put everything they have into these games. Middlebury is also a team that is going to be running low on subs. I think they only have a couple people who are actually on campus. You know, they have so many people abroad this semester. So I really think for Tufts, it's just a great opportunity to, like, see what you can do against a team that like numbers wise matches you really well uh, so i think it'll take some smart playing on beaters you know obviously middlebury has really dynamic players in jason and kate and so it's like how can beaters kind of adjust to that or how can your defense kind of adjust to that um but i'd really like to see tufts kind of like take a win off of middlebury in at least one of the games play them really close and then really like see how the first game goes and then make the necessary adjustments to come about come back even stronger in a game too yeah, I think this is going to be a weekend of conditioning um, because, yeah, both teams usually ride on, you know, four or five subs on the bench at a time, which has been the story for many years in the college game, no matter what team you've been on. Um, so we'll see kind of which one's in better shape. I think if Tufts does take a win off of Middlebury this weekend, it's game one. I think they have home field advantage. You know, Middlebury has 
a trip to take in the morning. Their Tufts is on their own campus, and um, I think that would be their opportunity to strike. <laughs> yeah. With that being said, I still think in terms of my predictions for the week, I'm probably going to give it to Middlebury. I think they'll probably take it 2-0 for this weekend, just further kind of pushing them into a good spot. I think standings have fully frozen for MQC, but it'll still just be good okay, kind of exposure. You. You're right. MQC <laughs> doesn't freeze. MQ freeze. MQC freezes, I think, after this weekend. Yes. So this will be good for Middlebury to kind of cement their place in that top two teams. Um, I think they'll still have to play the third, but I think they've played all the other D2 teams outside of Emerson, so they'll probably be looking at a, a collision there in the finals. Yeah, um, I think mm. I think they'll, I'm gonna, I'll say it. I think they're all going to go 1-1. I okay. think Tufts can pull it off in game one, and I hope that they do because they've proven that they can beat these higher-level MQC teams. They beat Emerson at uh, qualifier, so I'd like to see them do it again. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's kind of fun about MQC right now is I feel like it's like it seems so like, no, this is the best team. And this is I, I do think Harvard is far and away the best team currently in MQC. But I think a lot of the other teams do have parity. Um, you saw like Emerson playing teams close last week, Tufts beating Emerson back at qualifier and just like all these teams kind of playing close with each other. Um, so it's really kind of exciting to see how it's going to shake out when it comes to bowl games, which are on the horizon um, don't need to talk about them yet, but I think starting not this weekend, but the next weekend, they, they should be picking up. Um, so something to look forward to. Yeah. So, um, thanks for joining us. Um, make sure you turn into the MQC Facebook page on Saturday, uh, starting at 11 AM for a live stream of this weekend's games and catch us next week for a recap and a preview of the following week.